The church is sacred. It's reverent. Holy. But the church is more than just a building. It can be much bigger when we let it be. The church is people. It's you. It's me. It's all of us. And this is a program about the church that's happening in our world today. Hi, I'm Bobby Schuler. Welcome to Hour of Power. Today we're in the second segment of the Life in the Spirit series. We're talking about incarnation, which is this rich word that means that in Jesus Christ, God became flesh. And in Jesus, uh, we get to see what kind of a person God is like. But the great thing is that God continues to be enfleshed in the lives of his followers. That means you and I, being filled with God's Spirit, continue to act on his behalf in the world. That means that when we see darkness in the world, we see that and say, that's my responsibility. God has given me a power to make a difference in that dark place. Also today, we have the opportunity to talk to a dear friend, Tim Timmons, who has gone through incredible trials. 13 years ago, uh, he was given only five years to live. Today is the second portion of this interview. And we get to hear more of Tim's heart as he sort of struggles through the difficulties of life and finds incredible joy in his faith. For now, let's go over to Shepherd's Grove. To dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to bear with unbearable sorrow, to run where the brave dare not go. from afar to try when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable star this is my quest to follow that star no matter how hopeless no matter how far to fight for the right without question or pause to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if I only be true to this glorious quest, that my heart will lie peaceful and calm when I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this that one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable
heroes And some of them I've taken I've been lost so many times Forgotten or forsaken Tried to go where I thought That things would be the way I want But heaven knows I was never satisfied but you knew then everything that I know now. Oh, you knew me when I couldn't find my faith. I couldn't keep from falling down. You were the light. I didn't know I had just waiting to be found. You had my heart. Cause you Everything that I know now And every stone I stumbled on That led to my unwinding You followed like a shadow and You blessed the path behind me You gave me strength Coming up next, I get to talk about the Incarnation. This is something I'm very passionate about. We believe that God uses regular people to make a difference in the world. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus looks at a sea of normal people and he says, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth. God continues to reveal himself through the lives and bodies of moms and dads and engineers and accountants and all sorts of people. God continues to use regular people to make a difference in the world. Today we're going to talk about the Incarnation. Um, incarnation, if you know Latin, that means to make something into meat, quite literally. 
Incarnation, he speaks Spanish, carne is meat, right? To enflesh something. <laughs> it's okay, it was meant to be a joke. I was actually, <laughs> I was a little bummed and only Ernie laughed. <laughs> Thank you, Ernie, lighten the mood a little bit here. Um, yeah, incarnation literally means to enflesh something or in meat something, to actually take uh, take something we, uh, by default, something spiritual, and put bones and skin on it. Don't worry, it's going to get even weirder than this. Are we ready? Before we talk about the incarnation and we, we talk about what Jesus is doing through the church, we, we first have to understand the spirit and spirituality. Um, there is no biblical word for spiritual. Principle number one. Both in Hebrew and in Greek, you will never find a word spiritual. There is spirit. In Hebrew, it's ruach. In Greek, it's pneuma. But you'll never find a word that, that something is spiritual because that idea, by, by giving this adjective, this thing is spiritual, denotes that there are other things that are material and therefore not spiritual. That over here you have your spiritual things and over here you have your sort of unspiritual or material things and that the two are sort of unrelated. And because in a, Judeo, a true Judeo-Christian mindset, the two are inseparable. In other words, everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual in a biblical worldview. Not just when you pray, and that is very spiritual, but uh, when you go to the movies, that's spiritual. When you do your work, that's spiritual. When you create something, that's spiritual. When you spend time with your family and friends, man, that is spiritual. Principle number one, for Jews and Christians, everything is spiritual in a biblical worldview, everything. Now, there are some things that are more spiritual than others, and the principle number two is this, not all things that are spiritual are good. This thing, ISIS, that's happening in the Middle East, that is a very, very spiritual thing that is happening. Very spiritual. So just because something is spiritual does not make it good. In our worldview, as Christians, we believe everything is spiritual, and we believe that spiritual things are dangerous and require chastity. <laughs> what? One step at a time, just follow me here. We are ordinarily think of chastity as either not having sex or having sex within certain boundaries, but chastity in its original idea means putting boundaries around anything that's spiritual. That the spirituality is focused, narrowed in, zeroed in. That because spiritual things are powerful things, the more spiritual something is, the more powerful it is, also the more dangerous it is. The Greeks said it this way. The Greeks said, we are fired into life with a madness that comes from the gods. This energy is the root of all love and all hate, all creativity and all joy and all sadness. This word that they used is eros. It's the life of the spirit, the eros. Oftentimes we think of eros as, as uh, the love, like a sexual love, and that's true. But sometimes it's better, especially in this context, to think of it in terms of desire or what the Spirit does. So the Spirit is your true self. It's your will. It's your inner being. And it desires certain things. And that will, that Spirit, changes. And that Spirit is passionate. And that Spirit is powerful. And what the Greeks are saying is every time a baby is born, a human being comes into this world, it doesn't come in calm and collected, does it? <laughs> Right? You, you, see, you see from a baby, first of all, blood and screaming and crying and clawing and passion. Every baby, if it is alive, is screaming with eros, power, passion, unbridled, untamed, untrained spiritual energy, flailing, screaming, crying, exploding with life. Can I get an amen? amen? A baby, so a baby comes into the world spiritually 
a flame. And it's a good thing that baby isn't, you know, 200 pounds, six foot three, or else it'd be very dangerous. <laughs> Am I right? And so every human being, you see, you see the spirit in a baby. You see the human spirit naked, crying, screaming, a flame. That's the human heart. Everyone comes into life like this, and then that spirit becomes trained, formed, shaped into something not different in its essence, but more refined. And some are more refined than others. Like Ernie, <laughs> refined. <laughs> And so Ronald Rollheiser, whom I'm pulling from in a, in a big way, talks about how in a Christian spirituality, uh, spirituality does not mean always doing what's right. Spirituality means what do you do with this passion, this fire, this eros that burns inside of, of your soul? And he took three women, all of whom have passed, three very, very spiritual women whose spiritualities took three different forms. Mother Teresa. Oh, there it is. Mother Teresa. Oh, you can see I pulled them from the internet. A little pixelated. I'll get, I'll get an HD one next time. Sorry, guys. Mother Teresa, Lady D, and Janice Joplin. So here are three very, very spiritual women. Let's start with uh, Janice Joplin. Anybody ever see Janice Joplin in concert? Just out of curiosity. She died before I was born, but I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> but uh, she was an amazing musician, right? <laughs> take it! Take a little, little piece of my heart now, baby! <laughs> right? <laughs> Not funny. Don't clap, please. It's simulating. <laughs> Janice Joplin. Janice Joplin was an incredibly spiritual woman. Fire, passion. She would get up on stage, and she would dance, and she would flail, and she would scream, and she would arch back, and... Right? She was a flame with passion. Janis Joplin was asked once, what's it like to do one of your concerts? And she says, it's a little like making love to 10,000 people and then going to bed alone. <laughs> and that's a picture into an incredibly spiritual life that's also an incredibly dangerous and even harmful life. Because as we know, the demise of Janis Joplin is that this passion, this fire, ultimately kills her, right? Destroys her and maybe harms some others around her as well. So she was spiritual, she was aflame, she was passionate, but she was unchaste, out of control. Mother Teresa, on the other hand, anyone who's ever met her has talked about how passionate Mother Teresa is. My grandfather met her a couple of times. And just the, the way, how passionate she is about everything she's doing. But the difference between Mother Teresa and Janis Joplin is not that one is more spiritual than the other, but that Mother Teresa wanted just one thing. All she wanted was the kingdom of God. And for her, that meant justice in Calcutta. That meant that dying poor children wouldn't be alone in the gutter, forgotten and uncared for. And so she, you know, she begins her teaching career in a, in a, I think it was a convent, like very, very uppity school for rich children, and she's looking out the window, seeing literally children die in the gutter, and she said, no more! You know, this little woman, she marches out and just begins to just care for people, and people that talked to her just talk about how passionate she was. There's the story where she's holding a child, and the child, uh, she's, Mother Teresa is doing her, uh, 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 an interview with a reporter, and she's holding this child, and at the end of the interview, the child urinates all over Mother Teresa as the kid is sort of dying slowly. And the reporter, thinking Mother Teresa couldn't hear her, turns to her cameraman and goes, oh, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And Mother Teresa looks up and grabs her by the jacket, and she says, neither would I! <laughs> you know? powerful woman who her eros, her spirituality, was it harmful? It was life-giving. It brought life to those around her. It comforted the afflicted. It afflicted the comfortable. It changed the environment around her. 
Because within Mother Teresa and within you is an incredible power to change just about everything for better or for worse. Most of us are like neither of these women, completely out of control or completely focused on the kingdom of God. We're like, we're like uh, Princess Diana, who also was a very, very spiritual woman. But she was torn, wasn't she? On one hand, Princess Diana, uh, you know, did the unthinkable, divorced the, the, the Prince of Wales, you know, and traveled to Monaco and w- did all of these, incre- you know, parties and, and, uh, and t- going to the beach and meeting people and affairs and, you know, always on the cover of People magazine. So you got sort of on one hand the sort of Janis Joplin type, uh, not hedonistic, but close to hedonistic kind of life. And on the other hand, you've got a, you got a Princess Di who is giving to charity and, and fighting for what is right and, and, and promoting, uh, you know, justice causes. And so you have this woman who is doing both. Sometimes she's focused on what is good and, and what is helping the world, and then the other times she's just a big mess. That's what I'm like. And that's what you're like. Most of us are like Lady Diana, and we're pulling, being pulled in either direction between Mother Teresa and, and Janis Joplin. Some of us are like none of these. Some of us have gotten to a place where we are so tired, so bored, we have taken that burning flame, and now it burns barely like a cold blue pilot light, ready to be brought aflame, but still burning cold, only barely noticeable in the darkest room. And all of us hate it if we're that way. All of us, all of us want to burn a flame, but the danger is that we'll be, we feel like we'll be like Janis Joplin and harm ourselves and others not like Mother Teresa. All right? I've only begun, that was my first point on 15 points of my sermon. (laughs) All right. Acts chapter 2. I like everyone to feel comfortable. That's why I'm going to talk to you about speaking in tongues. We'll go ahead and turn to (laughs) Acts chapter 2. Now, just to preface this, we're actually not going to talk about speaking in tongues today, but it is coming on chapter chapter 5, okay? This passage, believe it or not, or not, is not really about speaking in tongues. It is. It's a big part of it. But this passage is really about the birth of the church and the Holy Spirit moving from the temple into a new temple. You and me. That's an amazing thing. I'm going to read it again. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Remember, Jesus, in the, before the ascension, last week we talked about it, promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to them. So they're waiting. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind, like the blowing of, so it wasn't really a violent wind, but it was something like that. You ever uh, been in a hurricane? Ever seen a tornado? I saw one once. It's like that. Imagine something so spiritually powerful that it feels like a hurricane. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated them and came to rest on each of them. So like tongues of fire wasn't actually tongues of fire. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Tongues means languages. Now there were sitting in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Now this is because Oh, be, oh, I'll get to this in a minute. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one had heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, "Aren't all these? Whoops! Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us uh, hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Alamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. <laughs> Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? 
Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. <laughs> Pentecost, we very often associate the word Pentecost with Pentecostal, and don't do that, that's a mistake. Pentecost is the birth of the church. It is a Jewish holiday that's existed for even thousands of years before this event happens. Pentecost is called the Feast of Weeks. It is, Pentecost literally means the 50th day, and this is to celebrate uh, uh, the giving of the law to the Jewish people. It's the day that Moses ascends the Mount, Mount Sinai and God speaks to him and gives him this law. Let's hear a little bit of that story. Moses is, uh, Moses is uh, in the desert. He's called into a cave, and there he walks into a cave, and there is a bush a flame, but not consuming the leaves and the branches. It burns and yet still remains green and tender, and out of this bush comes a voice that says, Moses. It tells Moses to take off his shoes and tells Moses that he's gonna call him to be a prophet and lead the Jews out of slavery, and that he's gonna go to Pharaoh and speak on behalf of God. And this is the first time in hundreds of years God has revealed himself to the world. Ray Anderson said this is the beginning this is really the beginning of theology. That's only cool to theology nerds like me. And Moses leaves this cave with something new, God's name and God's agenda. And he leaves, and many of us know the story. If you're probably picturing Charlton Heston in your mind. Charlton Heston leaves the cave and uh, goes before Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, let my people go. And God continues to bring plagues on Egypt each one worse than the one before, and then finally the last plague is the plague that that God warns Pharaoh, free the Egyptians or I will kill the firstborn of every Egyptian. And God tells Moses, sacrifice a lamb, take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorposts of the Hebrew homes so that the angel of death will know that this home is protected, okay? And that night, the angel of death passes over and it kills the firstborn of every Egyptian but passes over the homes of the Hebrews who have the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of their heart. This holiday is called Passover because the angel of death passes over these homes, okay? Of course, that's the last straw. Pharaoh releases the Hebrews. They go into the desert. They take all of this gold and everything with them and they're journeying and we know much of the story and they arrive at Mount Sinai and God is there on the top of the mountain And everyone is terrified because they see thunder. And behind the cloud, they know Yahweh God is there. And they believe if they can see God through the cloud, they will die. And God tells them if they even touch the bottom of Mount Sinai, they will die. And so they send Moses up into this cloud as a mediator to hear from God. So there Moses goes, ascending into the mountain, and God gives him the the, the law, which is the the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the, and the Ten Commandments, and Moses comes down, Charlton Heston comes down <laughs> with these tablets, right? And that's Pentecost. Pentecost is the, so Mount Sinai happens 50 days after Passover. So you have these two very important holidays. One that celebrates Passover, the angel that passes over the homes, the angel of death. And then 50 days later from that, it celebrates Pentecost. This amazing moment when God reveals himself again in Mount Sinai, gives the Torah, gives the law, and it celebrates how Moses is this mediator between God and his people. Are we still tracking, friends? Okay. In other words, uh, in this story, God is untouchable. God is untouchable. The sin of mankind does not mix well with the holiness of God, so much so that that any individual who sees God or touches God or touches something that God seems to be dwelling in will die instantly. If someone touches Mount Sinai, they die. If someone sees God beyond the cloud, they die. The Ark of the Covenant, there's a story where it starts to tip and one man wants to stop it from falling and the power of God's presence in the Ark of the Covenant, he dies. God is untouchable, right? His, his, his power cannot be touched. It, is, it can only be mediated between prophets and sort of through the word. Now let's fast forward to Jesus' day. Jesus dies the weekend of Passover. 
You hear me? Jesus dies the weekend of Passover, and he's often referred to as, for Christians, as the last lamb, the, the last sacrifice. When we take Eucharist, oftentimes we say that, the, that this cup represents the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of our heart. That because of Christ, we are completely brought into forgiveness, we are justified, and all of our sin is cleansed. And what does that mean? If, we, if our spirit is now cleansed of sin, it can touch and approach and be with a holy God without dying. And 50 days later, on Pentecost, on the Feast of Weeks, the day that celebrated Mount Sinai and the cloud and all of that scary stuff, the giving of the law, on Pentecost, when all sorts of people for all, all around the world are in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit comes, and now every single believer is filled with that spirit that was on Mount Sinai. Because of Passover, every single believer becomes a burning bush. In the same way that, that God's spirit filled the branches of that shrub in that cave, God's spirit on Pentecost fills the bones of every single believer. And just as God revealed himself to Moses through the burning bush, God will reveal himself to the world by burning you aflame in a good way. This is some heavy stuff, I know, but, but on Pentecost, the church is born when Jesus dies on the cross, the Holy Spirit leaves this place called the Holy of Holies and enters the life of every single human being. And so when you confess Jesus as the Lord of your life and you receive forgiveness, all sin is cleansed from your soul and now room is made in your heart for outside power, power of the Holy Spirit to dwell within you. And we, we track him? And so within every single human being is this passion, this eros, this fire, this desire. And when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, it comes alongside, and that's exactly what paraclete means, to come alongside. It comes alongside your spirit or your will and guides that fire within you so that it becomes life-giving. In other words, Jesus becomes now, because of the Holy Spirit, Jesus becomes present through the church. He becomes present through the whole church. That means that in a weird way, Jesus is sitting right next to you in that pew right now. Did you know that? Right now, uh, Jesus is, I mean, not in the same way of, that he was by then, but G because the Holy Spirit dwells and a believer is standing on either side of you in a weird way, Jesus is made present just next to you right there. And though most of us don't have the faith to believe this, every single believer has the power to do what Jesus did, if only they believe. And that person, that kind of power is right to your left, left, and, and to your right. A God that becomes untouchable, unapproachable, now becomes ever-present, dwelling within us. All right. Jesus becomes omnipresent in the church. In other words, we put skin on God. That doesn't mean we're God or that we're perfect. We're going to make all our same mistakes, right? We're going to age and we're going to sin and we're going to mess up and we're going to trip and yet still within us, alongside our spirit is the Holy Spirit that makes Jesus present everywhere you go. In other words, God, we always want God to sort of break open the clouds and sort of reveal himself by just saying, hello, I'm here, or, or reveal himself to people in a dream, or, or do the burning bush thing again. That seemed to work, you know. We, we always think, like, it'd be so great, you know, if, if God through these incredible miracles and theophanies just revealed himself just to people in that way. But God has chosen a new way to reveal himself to the world. God reveals himself to the world through you. And you have every choice in the world to say no. Many days when we wake up, we say no. God's in us. He's dwelling. His power is there. And he says, I want to reveal myself to the world through you. And we say no. Not today. I'm not up for that today. Not today, sir. <laughs> God reveals himself through the world, through the life, the joy, the passion 
the power of the church. Whether we heal someone who is sick or whether we feed a homeless person, or whether we forgive our enemies, we perform miracles in many ways, and when that happens, God is made revealed through your body. This is one of the things that that people can't understand. You see, many in the world, first of all, don't have spiritual eyes to sort of ethereally look for Jesus in a spiritual realm, and they they need to see Jesus uh, in you. In fact, when I first started the gathering, which later becomes Tree of Life, the best way I had made converts, if you will, was by inviting kids to, uh, to uh, serve with Jim Case at Isaiah House, make pancakes for homeless kids. So I would go to Chapman and other colleges, and I'd be like, hey, come to my church, it's really cool. And people would be like, oh, great, I'll be there. And they never come, right? <laughs> hey, come check out my church. Church is great. Come to me. Come to see what we're doing. No, I'm not interested, Right? But somehow, with a lot of people, especially college kids, I would go up to them and say, hey, would you like to get up at 5.30 on a Saturday morning and make pancakes for homeless kids? And they were like, yes, and they would come. It was bizarre. I mean, you won't get up at 11 to come have, like, coffee and relax and, like, you know, hear a really, you know, insightful sermon. But you will get up at 5.30 a.m. on a Saturday, very often after a hard night of partying, and you'll wake up a little hungover and go to Isaiah House and make pancakes for homeless kids. Absolutely. And what you found, what we found was that so many of these kids who would come to something like Isaiah House would see Jesus in the lives of other church members who were there, you know, making pancakes and friends with, with our homeless neighbors. And it usually took about a year, but in about a year, they started to see Jesus outside of those people and and sort of through their imagination, God reveals himself to these people where they see a Jesus that's sort of present everywhere in the church and they would say, I believe I want to be baptized. I believe in Jesus. I, I want this thing for me. See, God reveals himself to the world through you. You may be the only Jesus your neighbor will ever see. And if you say no, they will never see him. And if you say yes, you can, I mean, you could change the world. One person at a time. And one person comes to know Jesus, they're, very often their spouse and their kids and their grandkids and generations of people will know the Lord that wouldn't have just because you lived the Sermon on the Mount and you lived by the Spirit and you, and you prayed for someone and right? Here's a big difference. The difference between the theist and the believer, and I'll, I'll just sort of finish with this. The difference between a, a theist and a Christian. Theist, not atheist. A theist is anyone who believes in God. So, right? Christians are theists by nature. Jews are theists. Muslims are theists. Anybody who believes that there's a God is theistic. And if you're only a theist and you pray, this is the way you pray. God, I pray for my neighbor over here that you would help them with their financial need. Provide them with what they need. And then you believe that God will act in power from heaven in this person's life as you walk away. You see? The theist prays for God's work directly between himself and and the object that you are praying for. The Christian, the true Christian, because God lives in me, is volunteering him or herself to answer that prayer if need be. Does that make sense? If God is in you, and you're asking God to solve that problem, you are volunteering your own self to help that person. In other words, you have no right as a Christian to pray for your neighbor who has financial problems if you're not willing to help. Because God works through people. It's better to not pray. I mean, God does act, right? We see God do miracles all the time. God will provide them a job and do something great, and that's wonderful, but God loves to do it through you and me, right? We cannot pray for the homeless unless we're willing to help the homeless too because God, the Holy Spirit, is within us, and and he would use our body to make a difference. We cannot play, pray for the financial needs or the health needs or whatever for other people if we ourselves are not willing to volunteer. 
We cannot say yes to God helping this person and no to God using us. And, and yet we do. And I think the reason we do it almost always, that, the reason we almost always say no is because we're afraid and because we don't have any faith and we don't really believe that God is in us and we don't really believe God can use us and we don't really be- believe that we're good enough. It's amazing. And then, it's not just non-believers, it's the church. I mean, I don't, you know, we're, we're human beings, we as Christians, you know? We don't always just like always believe all the time, but there is something about when God uses someone to speak or work in our lives that we just really come to life in our, in our own faith. The thing I'm getting at, friends, is that you, you are the actual presence of Christ on earth, you are it. He does not have a plan B or C. There is plan A, it's you. That's it. And, and he, will, he, will not, he will not send angels from heaven. I mean, he does sometimes, but as a general plan, the, the main plan is to use you to, to be a beachhead for the kingdom of God. And every day, we so often get up and say, no, I will not allow God to enact his life through me because that's uncomfortable. And all the time you look at this board and you think about that eros and you wish, I wish I was alive, I wish I was aflame, I I wish I had a life of meaning and you still get up and decide to do the same rote, meaningless thing every day because you don't want to do something that's uncomfortable. And you know it, you want to come to life, you you want to have a life of meaning, you want want to change the world, you want to leave this place better than it was than when you came here and yet, and yet, it's so easy to say no, right? It's just so easy. And it's not like we say no the rest of our lives. It's not like we say, no, I'll never do it. We just say no day after day after day. And the days go by and the weeks go by and the years go by and every day we still get up and we say no to the Spirit. And yet the Holy Spirit is in you, the burning bush is in you, the fire of God is in you to make a difference in the world, and you say no. Come to life, friends. Be raised from the dead. Let the power of God work through you to to make a difference in the life of your neighbor. You may be the only Jesus your neighbor will ever see. Let's pray. Lord, we believe that. We believe that your spirit is in us. And yet through fear or desire to be comfortable every day, we remain unwilling to do your work. And so we repent. We repent. We're sorry. We repent. We pray that you'd bring us to life, that you'd spring within us new fire, new wind. We hate the darkness in this world. We hate it. And yet you want to use us to change it. We're afraid. Give us faith. We're weak. Give us strength. We're sick. Give us healing. We're tired. Give us energy. We're bored. Give us life. Bring us to life, Lord, we pray. Lord, we love you so much. And I love this church. I love those who are watching on television. I pray, God, that, that you help us all come to life and see your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen. If this message was meaningful for you, we want to send you a study guide called a curriculum for Christlikeness. Listen, ideas are one thing, sermons can be encouraging and motivating, but actions are another thing altogether, and that's ultimately what we want. We want people watching this program to not just be encouraged and inspired, we want people to become a different kind of individual, making a difference in the world around them. We think the Curriculum for Christlikeness, our study guide, can do that for you. You can use it in your own personal study, you can use it in some kind of a small group. If you would, just write to us or go to the website and we'll send it to you for free. Our address is P.O. Box 100, Garden Grove, California, 92842.
Coming up next, you get to see the second part of an interview with Tim Timmons. Tim and I hit it off so well the first time he came. We, we ended up talking actually for almost an hour on camera, and there was so much good content that came from that interview. We wanted to use part of it as a second interview. We really think that, uh, for those of you watching, that this will make a big impact on your life and that his story is, is compelling. Check it out. You and I have a lot in common uh, in, in many ways, uh, both of our dads. Uh, and grandpas, I think, right? Both of our dads were big Orange County pastors in mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Being a pastor's kid, yeah. that's informing your spiritual journey. And how, how did it shape, uh, like, I think of my own journey and it shaped me in a big way and, yeah. and, it, and I wonder, it must have affected you in a, in a big way in your, your relationship with Jesus. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it obvi obviously did. Yeah. Um, it shaped me in so many ways. I'd say that, uh, I've known all about Jesus my whole life. Mm -hmm. I've known all about him. I mean, if you want to do like a sword, sword drill, you know, where you like give scriptures back and forth and who knows more scriptures. I mean, I'm, I'm really good. I'm like a varsity American Christian. Nice. Like, try to beat me. You might be able to, but I'm pretty good. Yeah. And uh, I, it hit me maybe about six years ago, um, as Paul talks about being the Hebrew of Hebrews, such a great Jew. Mm -hmm. But next to knowing Jesus, it amounted to a pile of dung. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it just, it, it hit me. I know all about Jesus. I've pointed people to Jesus my whole life. I just don't really know him. I'd spent time with him in the past, but really going, Jesus, what are you about? My whole life, I've made fruit of my labor. Yeah. Like, Tim, you need self-discipline. You're a Christian. Yeah, yeah. Buck up, Timmons. Yeah. Try harder. Uh, try harder. Like, yeah. uh, you need to have more joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peace. You should not be worried right now. You sh you're a Christian. Yeah, sure. And it's like, I've just made all this stuff my whole life. You would have said you knew Jesus, right? I mean, if I had asked you eight yeah. years ago, yeah, do you yeah, know yeah, Jesus? Yeah, of course. My dad came to me nine years ago, and my dad, you know, you know, they, sure. they just know a lot of stuff. Yeah. And he said, Tim, I'm trying to do the hardest thing I've ever done. I'm like, and? said, I'm trying to follow the principles and teachings of Jesus. I'm like, duh. Yeah. Isn't that what we're all doing? You know? Yeah. And then I started to watch my dad's life change. Like really, I just watched my dad change. Mm -hmm. And um, Jesus took me through my own little journey um, these past six years. But I'm just going, oh, okay. So I've been a believer my whole life. But Satan's a believer and the demons are believers. Mm -hmm. They yeah. tremble, they believe so much. Yeah. So almost who cares? And the more that I'm looking at it, it's like Jesus so rarely uses the word to believe. Yeah. It means to be found living in. Yeah, sure. Not, I believe it. It's like, I believe that dieting is a really great thing. Yeah. I believe that eating right and working out is super great. I mean, that yeah. is the right thing. I believe that to the core of me. Yeah. But I don't necessarily do that. Yeah. Do we do? I mean, so we can believe all we want. It doesn't yeah. even matter. Like, yeah. who cares? Yeah. Um, but Jesus generally, as you know, keeps leaning in and inviting us to follow. Yeah. yeah. And the disciples, you don't have to be a Christian to follow, as you know. It's like, hey, anybody can do this. I feel like there's a lot of people listening that are like, you know, that's me. I mean, like, I feel that way, you know, like I'm doing everything right. I go to church, I do all, yeah. the, all the right things. But yeah. I, I, I try to know Jesus, I and mean, I try to pray, I, I, yeah. I try yeah, to, yeah. you know, and it's just nothing, nothing's happening, and like, what do you say to those people? One of my big goals was to get signed by a label, because I, I play music, and it's what I do, and yeah. have them hear my stuff, and yeah. um, it was five years ago that I wrote this prayer, it's the last song on my record, it's called Only One Standing, and I've prayed it every day since, so I write this daily, little X in my wrist, just reminding me, Timmons, seek first the kingdom of God and not your kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the, the chorus is, I surrender all, would you let my kingdom fall, so yours alone will be the only one standing. Yeah. And so I, that's like a daily prayer of, okay, this is not about my kingdom. Yeah. This can't be about my kingdom, because every time it's about my kingdom, it's about me. And Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and I will work stuff out for you. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is listening right now and watching right now, uh, I would say, think about the last time you got offended or frustrated. I mean, I think of the times that I just got frustrated and it was because my kingdom was totally threatened. Yeah. Or if you're a woman, <laughs> your queendom was threatened. Yeah. yeah. And it's just not about your kingdom or your, or your queendom. And, and as, a, as a guy who's been diagnosed with cancer, um, 
I don't know, we're, we're, we do a lot of things. I go to the doctor, we do a ton of things. But the outcome is not up to me. Yeah, that's right. And so I, I just, I travel the country and the country we are addicted to worry. And we're addicted to like making the outcome happen. And so I guess a real practical thing was even just with my career, I, uh, I started praying, let my kingdom fall. So yours be the only one standing. If you want to do something great for your kingdom, Jesus, and somehow you're going to use me, then go right ahead. Yeah. When we worry or get or, or, or frustrated, what we're really worrying about oftentimes is our own kingdom. Yeah. And, um, and it sounds like what I hear you saying when you're talking about this kingdom language is that somehow, and you're not even sure how, but somehow you learned to, to take Tim's crown off and sort of just give it to Jesus and be like, you're almost like forced to do that or yeah. something. I, I mean, I think it's that, that, that is part of the gift of, of sorrow. And that people who are listening right now and watching, there's so much sorrow. Yeah. And um, Jesus talks about joy in the midst of sorrow. Yeah. That's complete. Yeah, yeah. And you know very well, like I, I've, my whole life I've grown up with the good news. It, did you give a gospel message today? Meaning Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Yeah. He rose again. You know, we, we all know what the gospel message is. Absolutely, yeah. But according to Jesus, that's not the good news. According to Jesus, the good news is the good news of the availability of the kingdom. Yeah. That is here and now. It's almost as if the wood of the cross is like the wood of the doors of the wardrobe into Narnia. Yeah. Like Jesus is saying, <laughs> just come on, come on. I know, you, I know you've blown it. I know you've uh, sinned. Yeah. It's gross. It's, it's nasty. But guess what? I took it. Yeah. Just accept it and thank me every single day. Yeah. But, but get up. Yeah, yeah. Just stop your worrying. Like in my kingdom, okay, if you want to stay there and you're in worry, that's fine. But like in my kingdom over here, come through me. I'm the door. I'm the gate. Yeah. There's a whole nother world over here that you could actually live in peace and joy in the midst of your circumstances. Yeah. That's good news right there. Thanks, Tim. We really appreciate you being here. You really brought a lot of life uh, to our community and really enjoyed this time talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. As we bring this program to a close, we like to end every episode with a spiritual discipline. A spiritual discipline is either a type of prayer or almost homework assignment that you can live out in your own life to sort of bring the theme to the next level. Today, I'm reading from the curriculum and it includes a prayer from Teresa of Avila that really describes well um, the incarnation. And what I wanna encourage you to do is sort of look at your hands, look at your feet, look at your body as I say this and think on this with me. She says, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. Yours are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. As you listen to those words, what kind of ideas come to you? What kind of people do you think of that need to know Jesus but they can only see him through your body? Begin as the week goes on to pray for people that need to know Jesus, but maybe they'll only see him through you. They say that depression from infertility is one of the hardest ones to deal with. We had this, this life plan that we had laid out, and um, I think it was actually for three kids, right? We used to say it was for three kids. You expect something to happen and you hope that it's going to happen and it doesn't happen. And you just feel that there has to be some other reason why. There's, there's some bigger presence out there that, that is in charge of things. We grew up in agnostic households, both of us. So it's not that we were atheists or we didn't believe in, in, in God. It just wasn't really uh, spoken about. It wasn't really an issue in our household infertility sort of threw us for a loop and um, for the first time in our lives we really 
started looking around and thinking seriously about religion and praying and found our way to the Our Power on TV. We were going to do a fifth IVF cycle and we were gonna pull out all the stops, gonna take the medicine, and I got the stomach flu. And I couldn't do the cycle, and we had to cancel and lose our deposit, and thought, okay, well, this is it. You know, we're not gonna be able to, to do this anymore. And that same month, we found out that I was pregnant. We were at our lowest point, and now we have three kids. Didn't know if we would ever even have one. I don't like to tell people, oh, it's okay, you know you're gonna have a baby, like, you'll, you'll have a baby, because they might not. You have to get to the point where you know that whatever happens, that you've done what you can do, and God will give you what you need. It might not be what we want, but it'll be what we need, because God blesses all of us. If you're in sort of a spiritual crisis and you're looking for hope, it's really the right place to be. You want to hear that all things are possible with God. You want to hear that, that God wants the best for you. That's, that's exactly the kind of message that we needed at, at that point in time. I came to Christ through the hour of power. That's how it happened for me. We found that there is hope, that, that you know there is a plan. God has a plan for all of us. We're one story of one family that this, this program has changed the very course of our lives. I can only imagine about all the other stories out there. You've just heard one of the many stories that we get to hear all the time. Someone who says, this program actually changed my life. The reason we're able to change lives through this ministry is because people like you give and support. Very often people think that, you know, that commercials are sold and that's just kind of how we pay for the TV and the expensive stuff that we do. In truth, we're able to do this because people like you support us and say, we believe in this ministry. So we want to say thank you to all of you. It makes all the difference in the world. Now know that your sins are forgiven and that your soul is restored. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.